When did you guys both start playing bass? I probably started playing first because I'm older, so I'll go. I started playing when I was uh, about 13, and uh, I had a Hofner violin bass. What year is that? 13, I okay, can well, 78. Uh, 76? Yeah, no, 70, yeah, 70, 76. Okay. So, I, yeah, I, I, I found one of, I, my dad worked for the city and somebody had left at a concert one of those Hofner violin basses like Paul McCartney used to play. Oh my God. I was a huge Beatles fan. So I found it in, in, in the city hall, uh, lost and found. So my dad was friends with the chief of police and he, we walked over there and he's all, the guy said, if no one claims this thing in like six months, you can take it home. No one ever came for it. Wow. And I would go with my dad on Saturdays down to work and like sneak in the bathroom and hold it in front of the mirror. <laughs> I learned how to play smoke on the water. And uh, yeah, so I took two bass lessons and, uh, but the guy was smoking so much weed that that was pretty much me sitting there watching him smoke weed, he teach me a couple notes, and so I just learned on my own after that. My story's not quite as interesting, but uh, probably about the same time, um, probably around 76, 77, I started playing bass. I was, um, I was big into sports when I was a kid. I played uh, soccer and ice hockey, and uh, I had a... Um, a growth spurt in a, in a summer between 8th and ninth grade and it was uh, it just tore up all the connective tissue in my knees I grew like six inches so I had to wear knee braces so I couldn't uh, play sports anymore so I um, I had some friends who had a band they didn't have a bass player so I, I told my dad get me a bass for uh, you know just for to, to keep me busy and I um, I got a uh, it was like a Call of Rebelli P bass co uh, copy or something like that. Um, and uh, I never took any lessons. I just kind of sat down and started sounding things out. In the beginning, I whatever I could technically handle, I would play. So, you know, it was like, you know, I played some Black Sabbath songs and everything from Sabbath to the Beatles and, and, and everything in between. So. That was uh, that was the beginning. When did you first start listening to the Ramones? <laughs> first yeah. time I heard the Ramones was probably around yeah. seventy, yeah. probably around seventy five, seventy six. But that's because I had older cousins yeah. who lived in Queens, um, and they used to turn me on to all kinds of music. Um, so it's probably about that, probably about that time. But I didn't start listening to them until a couple of years later. I was uh, hanging out and um, I met this girl, and uh, I went back to her house with her, and uh, it was the first time I had ever smoked pot. First time I ever kissed a girl. I went to, went to her bedroom and we, she pulled out the Ramones record, and turned around. The first album was like, "You ever hear the Ramones?" I was like, "Yeah, I've heard them," but that was really when I. I got into the Ramones was uh, was that day. That's when I was kind of like, oh my god, that's really good stuff. So yeah, I'd probably say seventy eight. A friend of mine's sister had a had a couple. She had uh, probably the first two records, and we went in her room when she was gone. We were listening to them, and uh, it just seemed a lot better than than the new gen records we've been. Listening to you earlier that afternoon. So I think when was the last time you uh, you both visited Japan or se separately? But when? Except well, last time I was there about four years ago, we did uh, a festival with the adolescents there, and uh, it's great. We had a great time. It's a crazy place. What festival did you do? Thanks. <laughs> it wasn't Fuji. Like no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't one of the big awesome ones like you've done. It was. <laughs> No, it was, uh, I think you actually, the magazine Punk Rock Confidential put the whole thing on. And uh, uh, we were, it was quick. Like we went in, play, we played the day we got there. 
Uh, it's the only time in my life I've ever played a Flying V copy oh, on stage. Oh Bass? <laughs> Guitar. Oh, okay. Um, uh, for whatever reason, that tour, I played guitar and Warren played bass. So, um, yeah, we were in and out. We had the next day, just the whole day to see the city, and we cruised all over the place. And in fact, when we were there, the day we left, or, or the day after we left, was a day that guy stabbed a bunch of people in Electric City. It was like right on the street corner where we had been hanging out, like all afternoon. Do you remember that? It was like yes. a big yeah. news thing, yeah. yeah. So we had been there like 24 hours earlier in the same place. But uh, that, was, that was the last time I was there. I think that guy was an adolescence fan. He was looking for us, maybe he was. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I was in Japan was uh, just this past summer, 2013. We did um, uh, the uh, Fuji Rock Festival. Um, and I had Johnny Two Bags and Dave Hidalgo from Social Distortion playing with me because Steve and uh, Dan and the adolescents were over in Europe at the time. Uh, but uh, we went over and did that festival. It was incredible. It was really, really, really good. Great, uh, uh, great turnout of Ramones fans. When we went on, there was just a whole mess of Ramones fans right up front. And it was, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was good. What was the difference between the scene in Japan uh, compared to the scene here in the States? Uh, I know for the Ramones, it was, um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things, obviously, that are going to be different because it's totally different culture than the culture here in the States. But like the like some of the real, real noticeable, obvious ones are, in between songs, you could hear a pin drop. It was like completely silent in between songs. Um, but like the fans were just... cool beyond cool like we would whenever we traveled in Japan for city to city we always took the bullet train every morning we go we go down to the bullet train there would be a huge group of fans they would have, bring us little packages of food and and toys and stuff to do on the train and stuff uh, <laughs> which was totally bizarre to me but it was re it was really cool at the same time but it that's the fans in general. But as far as scenes go, the, just the scene in Japan seems to be a lot more organized. There seems to be a lot, there's a lot more communication. If you're into a band, most of the, the kids I know that are like into bands, they're part of some kind of fan club or some kind of like real tight knit group where everybody knows what's going on. Um, it's a lot like the states used to be. There's like, like the fans there are fiercely loyal to the bands that they like. It's not like that in the States anymore, but in Japan it still is. It seems like people really, when they like a band, they they really like them and they buy everything that they put out and get all the t-shirts. So I, there's, some, there's some major differences. Realistically, <laughs> unfortunately for us, the, the scene there seems to be a lot better than the scene here these days. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's when it's it's cool. Whenever you go to Japan, you always know you're going to be treated good, and you know people treat you with respect, and you're respected as an artist rather than like here, where you go to play a club and the local guys that load your stuff and treat you like you're an asshole. You know, it's it's it's, it's a lot different. Yeah, I'd, I'd say definitely on a promotion or you know, or a production end, like everything over there just seemed to run really smooth. Everyone was really, you know, cool to you and stuff. The thing is, like, I'd say, like, California, punk, Southern California punk rock bands, I still, out of everywhere I've been, like, that's probably the best place yeah. for punk rock, Southern California. But once you step outside of that, and even just down the highway to San Diego or or up to San Francisco, it changes a lot. And uh, in that in that instance, it's like a, uh, you know, I, I would say the the, the the, the fans in Japan, how they're excited they get. Like people get like that here too. Not quite as much because they're used to seeing our bands. Right. But but outside of it, like outside of that, like um, of those two places, New York, San Francisco, whatever, the fans are just kind of not as uh, 
excited, I guess. Yeah, they're jaded. Yeah. They're jaded. That's, it's a, you know, I agree 100%. Absolutely. That, that's why the Ramones did their final shows in L.A. They didn't do them in New York. They did them in L.A. Because punk rock and rock and roll has been dead in New York for a very long time. But Southern California, it's still respected. It's still big. People still love it, and that's the uh, you know, that's a but that's the thing that makes it different than every other place that you go to in the states. You might come into a city where there's a cool punk rock scene, like a real small cool rock punk rock scene, but nothing compared to what it is out here. So, uh, what were some clubs in? in the 80s that were really prominent and helped out the punk scene mostly? It, it, for us, it wasn't so much clubs as promoters and stuff. You know, Golden Voice, uh, who become a huge corp, you know, company, corporate thing where like they do Coachella now and all that. But when that started, it was one guy, Gary, booking shows in Santa Barbara and then came down here and he, and he got a couple other guys working with him. And they did shows all over the place. They were renting halls. You know, they put bigger shows in the Hollywood Palladium, but um, it wasn't the clubs themselves. The club owners, you know, there's certain, like, there's a club called the Cuckoo's Nest that was like a late famous Ramones played there. But that guy, that guy was, you know, I mean, like, he's now releasing documentaries and stuff, stuff saying, oh, I did it for the kids. And, and he's cool, like, I'm cool with him, but I just saw something someone else said about him that's true at the end of the day he burned a lot of bands he wasn't you know yeah. it was like we made that scene happen not him mm -hmm. you know and he just he there was a place we could do it at but it wasn't like like he was uh, like nurturing it or anything it was just he was making money off it so that was cool and uh and i just saw the cbgb's movie and they i don't know if how much truth is it is or is in it, but like they portray Hilly as someone who was like nurturing those bands yeah. and giving them, you know. And there was people like that later on in the like late 80s and 90s. There's a woman that had a club called the Doll Hut, Linda Jameson. And like she, she was like that. And, uh, and I've come across promoters that are like that, but certain clubs, I guess, or whatever from back then, everyone was playing like the Cuckoo's Nest or the Starwood and the Whiskey in LA. And the, those clubs were there to make money. They, you know, it wasn't like they were looking out for the musicians or cared about them, I don't think. We looked out for each other. In New York, there was just a whole bunch of clubs. It was, everyone knows, obviously, CBGBs, but you know, there were a whole bunch of them, Continental and the Pyramid. And just the Lower East Side was filled with clubs. If you were a punk rock band, smaller punk rock band, you had places to play that was... You know, it was a really good scene, especially in the real early 80s. Um, but um, the, the, uh, I think the difference was is that there was no money to be made. You know, that nobody was making money. The clubs weren't making money, but neither were the bands, you know. It was just kind of like that. You know, New York has always been an expensive place to do business, but there was so many clubs back then that you could play especially on the Lower East Side there was never a shortage of shows you could go out just about any day of the week and see a good band uh, and you know it was never expensive to get in you know the shows it was always cheap to get in but um, you know now of course they, they're all gone um, the only one still around is uh, Continental, and it's not even a live music venue anymore. It's just a regular bar. But uh, you know, the it was really, you know, while there were individual um, clubs and bars and whatever, it was really just a very good scene in general because you had good bands and you had good places to play. So it was good. That was definitely the good old days. Uh, what's uh, the Ramones beer of choice and the adolescence beer of choice? Like that one beer that, you know, <laughs> I got to ask the beer question. The, so, so by the time I got into the Ramones, um, Mark was on the program. Uh, Joey was uh, no longer partying. And Johnny used to drink one beer after the show. So um, 
the Ramones choice of beers would have been my choice of beer. So, and I drink Guinness, so usually that's what I drink. So, that would be the... <laughs> I, as the only surviving member that partied in the band, I could say Guinness. <laughs> Speaking of the program... <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, there's not a lot of drinking going on in the adolescents these days. So, uh, I'm sure at some point you'll interview Dan, because he's playing on this too, and you could ask him, because he's the beer connoisseur. He drinks all those weird craft, like uh, Artie. I think you should either drink Coors, Budweiser, <laughs> Hams, Paps Blue Ribbon, and I don't understand the way kids drink beer these so days. Yeah, yeah, they kind of turned it into like a uh, an art form or something. Beer choice was probably Jack Daniels. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Uh, how has the scene, the music scene changed uh, for you guys from the 80s uh, to now in 2013? Uh, what are the major changes and uh, ways to make, make money as an upcoming musician? As an upcoming musician? I, I, I don't, the music scene's changed so much I don't even know. Yeah. If I was to start my first band right now, I would yeah. even... There's no business model, there's no clear way of doing it like they used to be you know it used to be that you would you know put together a band you know play a bunch of shows get a little following going get a bunch of people to know who you were um, um, do some kind of recording some kind of self-finance thing and hopefully attract attention of a record company who would then come out and see you you would do a showcase you would get signed to a record label they would give you an advance on against every penny you would ever make for the rest of your life and uh, you would cut an album and they would put it out and promote it and everything else but it's just not like that anymore there's no there really is no more record companies um, out there that do that kind of thing anymore um, you know promotion is mostly about you know uh, social media and and website not even websites anymore but it's just a completely different game the whole the whole thing is just it's not even like there's different rules there's just it's a whole different thing now so it's uh it's difficult it's even even if you're established even if you're you know like me and steve and been in the business a long time and and know a lot of people and have a fan base and everything else it's still very difficult to to get your music to the people and and to to get out and go on tour it's, it's still a tough uh a tough way to make a living uh, what was the chemistry that went into making the Adolescence uh, Blue album the uh, Like, how, how did that album become... Speed <laughs> and liquor. <laughs> how, how did that album become such a, a prominent album in punk rock? And, I mean, even to this day, I mean, you hear it in all the new video game soundtracks. And I it, think more than anything, we weren't, like, grown up singing about Teenage Rebellion. We were teenagers documenting what was going on in our world. So all those songs about being a, a fucked up kid were written by fucked up kids. Not, you know, I mean like, the album Quadrophenia by The Who is amazing. Pete Townsend was a grown up when he wrote it, you know what I mean? We're like, ours is more, I guess, more literal and because it's, we were kids, you know, so it was, uh, and that's, like I think why it holds up now is because a lot of the punk bands in the 80s were singing about Reagan and we weren't you know we didn't we just knew he was a dick we, we didn't know why we didn't like him <laughs> well we kind of did because my mom liked him <laughs> and if your parents liked something you knew it wasn't cool yeah, it was, uh, what, what was the major difference between the East Coast and the West Coast punk scenes uh, today and also in back in the day? The East Coast punk scene was not political. I, not the original, the, the original scene. Originally it wasn't at all. I, you know, like Ramones and, and Blondie and Television and the Talking Heads. and it was, it was really, realistically, more born out of like the art scene than anything else. Not the Ramones so much. The Ramones, they were, you know, they were like the evil Bay City Rollers. 
but um, not political, realistically not political, political at all. New York scene didn't really become political until the 80s, but um, but even on the West Coast, I mean, bands like the Dickies, obviously not political, you know, like the, it, there was still some of that. Uh, some of that here, but to me, the the West Coast bands were, and I don't, not just politics as in government politics, but even social politics. Um, it got yeah, they get in the eighties. The East Coast got more serious, I think, with like the straight edge stuff, yeah. and even the New York hardcore stuff. You know, they were, like those guys were straight edge too, right? Yeah. You know, where everyone here was getting high and and drinking, and you know, it was. I, I remember the first time I read an article about straight edge in D.C. I was like. Why would you do that? <laughs> like, where's the fun in that? Anybody that didn't drink or fuck or whatever, in, in where I was from, you were everyone would be like, if you're a teenage guy, and you're not fucking, you're a fag. You know that that really, you, everybody would have thought you were gay if you fucking if you weren't into girls. But if, if that scene just caught on so big, it was like it really got big really quick, and. Uh, I, I mean, I, I have to say, I liked a lot of the bands. I, I did like a lot of the bands. I just never got that mindset. Never yeah. got it. We did a tour of the Adolescents and Youth of Today in 86 or 87 together. And, you know, we were drinking and, and on drugs, and they were straight edge. And that was the first time that I, they were stretching before they went on. And we were like, what are you doing? And they were like, <laughs> we're getting ready to play. And we're like, but you look like you're getting ready to go jogging. You know, and, and I get it now, but like it's back then, it was just so befuddling to us. And but by the end of the tour, we all got along. We were good friends, you know. And uh, I still keep in touch with some of those guys, you know. Um, so it's yeah, it was. It's it's not like we were like there was some kind of hatred or anger. It was just what they did didn't make sense to us, though, for sure. And I'm sure vice versa, you know. But. Uh, but when we play together, it was great. And then there was bands like Agnostic Front. Those guys used to rage and party, yeah. and they were yeah. cool. You know. Yep. Chromax. New York. New York really had a a, a, a really deep uh, pool for talent when it came to hardcore. There was a lot of good hardcore in New York. But the um, but a scene like that cannot last very long. It can't last very long because everyone involved in it was hardcore. They were just they were really serious street hardcore kids, and you know how that goes. It's just partying and fighting and all that stuff. It, it's not a scene that can last forever. But the cool thing is that most of those guys survived. You know now you can, you can still go see you know Roger. And, yeah, a lot of them still play today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, same yeah. thing with, you know, you can see TSOL, yeah. Agent Orange, Adolescents, the Dickies. Yeah. Uh, the Germs are playing in a couple weeks, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, I mean, it, it, it's like the bands that made it through to the other side came out probably smarter and stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The nihilistic attitude is definitely toned down from it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. With, because you know when you're young, idealism and all that stuff, or just you know no tomorrow type of attitude and everything. But the older you get, the more you realize you know how much, how much more playing music and doing what you really like doing means than you know not doing drugs or drinking or having sex with girls or whatever. Yeah, you know, I mean you realize that all that stuff was. You know, when you were young, it really was just a flag to fly. You know what I mean? But the, uh, but underneath it all, really, the, 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 you know, the passion, it comes from the music. It's not the ideals. It's not the politics. It's not the, you know, dressing up like a cheap prostitute or whatever. It really is the music, you know? Everything else is fluff. Everything else is image and, and, and attitude. But the music is what you really love, you know, and that's what you find out when you get old, that everything else was just bullshit, you know, it was a stupid excuse to do something you like, so. And it, it, it's, it's good that, that a lot of those, you know, a lot of the guys survived to learn that, you know. 
because it easily could have been a whole, a whole lot more of them laying on a slab somewhere at a young age because the scene was, uh, you know, I, th I think, you know, you, you hear like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing, you know, you hear that used a lot. It's a big cliche, but back then, really, it was, the scene was very violent and uh, there was a lot of drugs involved and stuff. It's amazing that that this many people actually did make it to the other side. So. Uh, can you talk about your new album, uh, Reconquista? Yeah, so we recorded that right here. I, I actually um, I actually recorded the record three times. I recorded it twice on the East Coast um, and because it's the first record that I, I put the Ramon name on. I was really particular about how what I wanted it to be and recorded it twice out east and I was just having trouble getting it together and I was at my wits end and I called Steve up and I said, man, I, I don't even know what to, where to go or what to do at this point. I said, you know, I got a really good bunch of songs, but, you know, I'm just not getting out of them what I want to get out of them. And Steve said, eh, just give me a couple of weeks and I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. And then a couple weeks later, he called me up. He was like, all right, I got the studio book. Got a bunch of guys that want to come out and play on it and whatnot. So I flew out uh, with my bass. And uh, and we came to the studio, uh, me, Steve, and Jose Medellis, who we uh, both had played with in 22 Jacks. Um, came down here. We rehearsed for one day, one, one evening. And uh, we started laying down tracks the next day. But the, uh, you know, the, the beauty of it was that Steve got a whole bunch of other really good guitar players from Southern California to come out and, and uh, play on it too. And it was, uh, it was definitely, uh, you know, the record, I intended the record to be a salute to the Ramones and to the Ramones fans. So to have all those guys, you know, Billy Zoom from X and Johnny Two Bags from Social Distortion and... Dennis Casey from Flog and Molly. Um, Jay from Agnew. Bad Religion. Oh yeah, Jay Bentley from Bad Religion came out and played bass on the first track on the record. Um, you, just like a whole bunch of really great players came out, and uh, it, to me it was a much more fitting salute to the to the Ramones than uh, than what uh, what I had started with out on the East Coast. So it's just funny I had to come. I had to come to California to, t <laughs> to do a tribute record for the Ramones, but... But once again, you know, like you're saying, California is where they did the final shows, and it was California where there's this ton of guitar players yep. that all, you know, you had to tell them was, hey, CJ's out here making a record, and it's, you know, a salute to the Ramones. And they were like, all right, I'm there, you know. And uh, it, was, it wasn't like we had to grind anybody to get them to come out. Yeah. You know, everyone was like right away you know ready to do it it was pretty fun so we did the so we did the record and then you know we we really uh we really worked good together but you know we worked like i said we worked together in 22 jacks and and uh we had a lot of fun so you know when the record was done we started talking about going out on the road and, and touring and stuff and um and that's what we did i mean the, the last this last year, 2013, I've done more shows than any other year since the Ramones retired. So, you know, it's um, it's good. Dan and uh, Dan and Steve are, uh, you know, now we're getting we're getting ready to do the next record. Um, and on this record, I get a little bit of uh, I get a little bit of uh, relief because these guys will be writing songs on it too. So the pressure isn't all on me. But. Um, we're gonna be uh, we'll be back here in March to uh, to record a new record. So, uh, can we look forward to any new material in the future? Yep, like like we said, we'll be back here in March to do a new record. Um, was that the coffee pot? All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be back in March to do a new record um, out here in Santa Ana, and uh, we just want to get out on the road next year and um, and hit it as hard as we, hard as we can. But realistically, uh, I would like to do, uh, I'd like to get back to doing 100 plus shows a year and uh, 
I'm going to try to do a new record every year for the next four years. So that's, uh, that'll keep us busy for at least two or For four years. You know. <laughs> well, you, all right, so. And then we'll take it another four. I, lo I look at it this way. I got four, four more records to do, right? So 48 now, so that'll put me close to my mid-50s, right? And then it'll be the live record, the greatest hits record, right? So that tacks on like another two years. So we're talking about being close to 60 just <laughs> before we stop doing punk rock. And then we're gonna transi transition into the rockabilly country thing, so we could probably, we could probably, <laughs> We could probably keep this going for until those old blues guys are yeah, just yeah. driving around. Yeah. yeah, we could probably keep it going for at least till mid sixties. I got nothing else to do, so <laughs> I'll wait till arthritis takes me out of the game, and then I'll just become a singer. <laughs> <laughs>